All right, now let's try to understand these two matrices a little bit more, the matrices M and H that we introduced earlier. So recall that H was the matrix, it was the um, identity matrix, a three by three in this case, and another matrix Q, and M was Q, and then the identity four by four matrix. And both of these numbers can be generalized as long as it's an appropriate size um, and it satisfies the requirements that we made earlier, namely that H consists of all of the non-zero vectors in the vector space, cons um, Z mod two to the power, where that power is determined by the number of rows here. So given the setup, let's introduce a little bit more notation. And that notation is going to be, we're going to define these, um, that subspace, which was the kernel of H and also the image of M. So let's call these image of M, which is also the kernel of M, uh, kernel of H, rather. Let's denote this by C. So for the rest of these videos, C will refer to exactly that subspace. Now, remember, this is a four-dimensional subspace inside of Z mod 2 to the seventh. Okay. We're also going to introduce other notation. Let C subscript I be that subspace shifted by the ith unit vector in Z mod 2. So it's going to be C plus EI. And this just means, by definition, the set of all vectors of the form V plus EI where V is in C. Now this is not a subspace, right? Um, because we can't add two vectors and stay within the subspace, uh, is stay within the subset. But at the very least, you can think of this as um, the subspace shifted by some vector. And we can define this for all I between one and seven because that's how many non-zero vectors there are in, sorry, that's, that's, that gives us a basis of um, vectors in Z mod two to the seventh power. And now let's write some additional facts regarding these, subs, these subsets. So the first thing is that we already know that C is the solution set of a homogeneous system. Namely, it's the kernel of H. CI is also the solution set of some system, though it's no longer homogeneous. CI is the solution set of the inhomogeneous system HX equals HEI, where this is this whole thing, HEI, is the ith column of H. Secondly, if we take any two of these different subsets, CI and CJ, then CI intersect CJ. So if we look at all of the vectors that are common to both of them, it turns out there are none. So it's the empty set for all i not equal to j. Third, each of these subsets are also disjoint from the solution set of the homogeneous system. So C intersect Ci is also empty for all i. And finally, and this is maybe the most um, interesting part of it, is that the entire vector space of all vectors is the union of every single one of these. So it's the solution set of the homogeneous system with all of these other inhomogeneous solution sets. And because these are all disjoint, this is a disjoint union. So every vector in Z mod 2 is in exactly one of these subsets. It's either a solution set of the homogeneous system, or it's in one of these solution sets of the different inhomogeneous systems. 
So this is a very important claim. So let's actually, let's actually prove it. So the first claim, now when we solve in homogeneous systems, all we have to do is find one particular solution. And if we find that a solution exists, then the solution set of the inhomogeneous system is that particular solution plus the homogeneous solution that we obtained um, from solving, well, for the kernel of H. So notice, however, that we can just take x to be EI to get a solution set. So EI is a particular solution. And therefore, the solution set of the whole system of hx equals hei is that particular solution plus the homogeneous one. And that's exactly what the claim is. Ci is the solution set of this. Now, let's look at the second claim. The second claim says that these are all different. All of these subsets for different i and j have no common intersection. So in order to prove that, let's pick two vectors, one in ci, one in cj, and they're going to be arbitrary. And then we're going to show that the only way that they can be equal to each other is if those subscripts are equal, if i and j are equal. So let's start, suppose that we have two vectors. Now, because we're a solution set of the homogeneous system, the kernel of H, and the kernel of H equals the image of H, our vectors are going to have this form. So suppose m u1 plus ei, so this is our vector in ci, equals m u2, because we don't know if right these two could have different, they have come from different um, vectors plus e j. So suppose these we have these two vectors, and this one is in ci, this one is in cj. Now, if we apply h to these vectors, so let me just write that. This is in ci, this is in cj, so we're totally clear. Now, apply h to, these, this, to, to this equality, what happens? Well, because these functions are linear, and we apply h to both um, on the left-hand side, this becomes h m u1 plus h e i equals h m u2 plus h e j, right? And h m of u1 is 0 because h m is a 0 matrix. So this is 0, that's 0, and we're left with h e i equals h e j. Now, the only way that this is possible is if i and j are both equal to each other. And the reason is because h, by definition, is the set of all non-zero vectors in z mod 2 to the third power. And they never repeat. So we only use those vectors once and only once. And the only way that these two columns of h are, po are equal to each other is if those indices exactly matched up. So this implies ei equals ej, which implies i must equal to j. So this says the only common intersection among all of these is if the indices are the same. So now let's prove the third claim. The third claim says that the homogeneous solution set has no vectors in common with any of these inhomogeneous solution sets. In that case, the argument is very similar. I'll let you think about it. Now let's prove the fourth part. So this is where another counting argument is going to be very useful. Let's count the number of vectors in C and the number of vectors in CI, and what happens when we take their union and how many vectors we have in total. So the number of vectors in C is, is what? So C is coming from being the image of M, and we know M is injective. Therefore, no two vectors, when we map them forward, coincide in the image of M. 
and therefore the dimension of that image, sorry, the number of vectors in that image is equal to the number of vectors in the domain of that function. And the domain of m is z mod 2 to the 4th. So it has 2 to the 4 vectors, including 0. Now, how many vectors are in ci? Well, ci is c shifted by a single vector. And therefore, it has exactly the same number of elements as c does. So it's also 2 to the 4. And how many of them are there? There's 7 of these. So the total number of vectors in c union, because these are all disjoint, is the number of vectors in c plus the number of vectors in ci from i going from 1 to 7. So this equals 2 to the 4 plus 7 times 2 to the 4, but 7 is 2 to the 4 minus 1. So this equals 2 to the 4 as a common factor, and we have 1 plus 7, which is 2 to the, uh, which is 8, which is 2 to the 3rd, and that equals 2 to the 7. So the number of vectors here is 2 to the 7. Okay, how many vectors are there in z mod 2 to the 7? Also 2 to the 7. And all of these vectors are different. So the only way that this is possible is if the union actually equals the whole thing. Therefore, this union equals all of z mod 2 to the 7th because it contains all of the vectors in z mod 2 to the 7th. And that's the end of the proof. OK, so now let's discuss what the point of this claim was. Again, before we even talk about the applications, what is the significance of this? So the main point is that H can distinguish between vectors in C versus vectors in CI for any of the different I's going from 1 to 7. And this is because H of C as a subspace equals the 0 vector, right? Everything in C gets sent to 0 under H. And everything in CI gets sent to which vector under H? Well, we, we did that computation here. If we apply H to a vector in CI like this one, we get HEI, the ith column of H, which is a single vector. It's just one vector. And therefore, if you apply H to, let's say now, some arbitrary vector, vector v in z mod 2 to the 7th, it has to either be 0 or 1 of the columns of H because those are the only possibilities. H includes every non-zero vector. And therefore, if h of v is non-zero, it's one of the columns of h. And if it is zero, well, then it's zero. So, and if h of v equals zero, this tells us that v has to be in c. But if h v equals one of the columns of h, then v must be in ci. So it allows us to apply an operation to a specific vector, and it tells us which of these subsets that vector is sitting in. So now the question is sort of, what can we use this for? And that's going to be the purpose of the next video, where we'll talk about error correction codes and how this method can be used to isolate where an error occurs in a message and how to fix that error and obtain the original message that was sent.